my name is Dr. Tori Olds, and today I'd like to talk to you about transformation. Because there's some exciting new research within my field about how to transform. In other words, how to more quickly achieve a both deeper and more lasting shift toward health and well being. So, that shift can happen, as we will discuss, when our kind of conditioned expectations of how reality works and how we need to adapt to it, when those expectations can dissolve or at least evolve, so we're more freed up to adapt to reality as it actually is. So to make that shift, our brain must enter a learning mode of sorts, almost like more akin to being a child. Because the truth is, while during our childhood we are constantly learning about reality and what to expect and how to respond, once we have those assumptions, we pretty much just stick with them through the rest of our adult life. Why? It would just simply be too cumbersome to always be walking around like willing to learn how to be human again fresh every day, you know, with no assumptions about what's about to happen and how should I respond. So once we kind of have the learning down, we just automate it and assume that those rules are going to stick with us and we can use them in an unconscious way moving forward. The problem is, those expectations or rules don't always serve us anymore. Why? Well, they're based on a reality we're no longer in. At the very least, we are no longer the same. We're not the same people. We're adults now. And as adults, we have different capacities and different options. We're also very, very likely around different people. And it's nice if our brain can like get that memo, sort of. Now, certainly we do learn from our adult experiences. But usually those learnings kind of exist in different memory systems so that the new learning can be parallel and in competition with the old without necessarily changing what we originally learned. And therapies like CBT do a good job of sort of bolstering or strengthening the new learning so it can compete and perhaps even override our original felt sense of reality. And that produces incremental change, which is a good thing. But today I want to talk to you about transformational change, to borrow a term from Bruce Ecker. And in transformational change, we actually go to the original learning itself, update it with new information, so that then whatever symptoms or struggles were sort of launched by this belief that I can't trust people or I have to always please them, whatever outcome from this belief can sort of naturally dissolve ongoingly without constantly having to try to override it or convince ourselves that it is a good idea to do something that is different than what our original learning taught us. So those original learnings traditionally have been called schemas. So we'll use that term. So some examples of schemas are, in order to get attention, I have to be perfect or I have to be bad. If I let myself feel sad, I'll be rejected. And then I'll be alone with the sadness in a way that's so overwhelming that I have to find a way to not let myself feel sadness. My passion will be too much for people. So I must mute myself. And when I'm starting to feel excited, I'll feel anxious instead. If I take pride in my work, my insecure mother will feel threatened. So I'll never take pride in my accomplishments, even if it means I won't move forward professionally. So these underlying associations and beliefs about how the world works, these schemas, they exist in something called implicit memory. Now scientists used to believe that implicit memory, once it was encoded, could not be changed. But now we do know that it is possible to update our implicit schemas. Now I went over the science of that in the last video on memory reconsolidation. So let me just give the take home point and then we'll discuss application. So the bottom line is that if we want to change a schema held in implicit memory, the first step is to reactivate it, bring it into conscious awareness in a felt way, and the second is to provide disconfirming experiences, in other words, to have experiences or evidence that actually conflicts with the predictions made by the schema. So sort of prove the schema wrong. So once the schema has information come in that really disconfirms its belief, it enters that learning mode that I was talking about. It's as if the brain says, okay, I'm listening. I just had an expectation. It's not how things played out. Maybe I need to update my view of reality. 
So it begins to at least open to the possibility of learning. So now let's talk about how to apply both parts of this, the reactivation and the disconfirmation. So let's look at each in turn. So if we want to change our unconscious schemas about reality, we have to first make them conscious, which is really possible. And it's usually even possible to put them into words. Why? Because even though they're unconscious, they're usually highly specific. Like, if I'm not perfect, I won't get love. But again, the reason we try to put them into words is simply so we can feel that we're on the right track. We're not using language here in a cognitive insight manner alone. It isn't enough just to have the right words and rationally, theoretically maybe assume, I think this has something to do with the fact I wasn't loved as a child. We need to get the exact words and have them be felt. In fact, we use the words to almost ping off our unconscious. It's like if we have words like, if I let myself feel good about myself, I'll become arrogant and sort of narcissistic like my mother. And when we say those words, if they're right on with the schema, it's like our whole being will reverberate with how true that feels. It's like, yeah, that just feels, I mean, I know intellectually that may not be true, but it feels true. So as we're exploring, we put things into words to make sure we're on the right track and to open up that yes inside that says, absolutely, that feels true to me in a visceral way. So step one then is to really get to discover what the contents of the implicit belief are, what do we really believe, and reactivating it in a felt way. Now, let's talk about how to do that, because the truth is, it does take some inner exploration. And not everybody is equally comfortable or as familiar with inner exploration. So let's address that head on. So the first point is, there's a good chance that for this really to be sufficiently done, we'll need the help of a therapist. Why? Because most of us don't know how to take something that's more unconscious and make it conscious. Why? Because most of us had parents that didn't like speak the language of the brain or mind in the home. In other words, they didn't seem curious about the child's inner world and help them and teach them to reflect and understand their own internal process. Oftentimes parents fail that because honestly, they themselves don't know how to do that work, or maybe they're threatened by something that the child might feel or that the child might know. Like let's say the child, child was able to put their experience into words and noticed, hey mom, that hurts me when you do that. Well, the mom may not wanna hear that. In a case like that, the brain isn't learning, isn't having chances to learn how to track its own internal signals and bring them all the way out into verbal expression. In fact, it may be learning just the opposite, that to survive, it's better just to push those things out of awareness. So many of us actually have schemas that say, unconscious beliefs that say, it's safer not to know ourself. It's safer not to know what we feel or what we know or to really get what's going on around us. So if you're someone who is in therapy and finds himself saying, I don't know a lot, then you may need to be curious about what kind of schema might I have that's ma making it dangerous for me to know myself, to know my needs, to understand and have access to what's going on inside. Because the truth is many of us came from families where it wasn't that safe or at least encouraged to know ourselves. So given that's the case, when we start inner growth work, we have to appreciate we're asking our mind to do something very new and perhaps that it may have beliefs about like, don't look inside, no one wants to know that. No one's gonna find it's interesting. Whatever I find there, people can't handle. Maybe I myself can't handle. No one really can handle the true me or my true needs. So if you think that might be you, chances are you will need a therapist present with you to say, tell me, I'm so curious, that both seems interested and safe. And if the invitation is really clearly given and we feel safe, which does sometimes take a second to establish, 
chances are the information will begin to come. Because the truth is, this way of being able to understand and speak from a deeper part of ourself is a very natural thing for the brain to do. So as, as long as it's given a clear invitation again and feels safe, with a little bit of patience, information and insight might come, even if it never has before. So mostly when it comes to this internal exploration work, I just wanna give the encouragement to try because most of the time we just haven't tried yet. And in doing so, remember, this is not rationally based. So sitting down and thinking about ourselves or trying to analyze ourself is probably not gonna be helpful and is different than developing internal awareness. One of our oldest family friends was an analyst named Christopher Bolas, and he developed this term, the unthought known. I just love that term, the unthought known. See, our brain really does know things. It's like it just hasn't had the thought yet. So when we're doing this work, sometimes it's as simple as asking the question and a realization comes. And my clients are often struck, they're like, oh, it's like it bubbles up into awareness. Oh, I got it. Like, and maybe that they, the realization comes because I'll simply ask them like, hey, just turn and ask your mind. What's so bad about leaving my husband? What am I so terrified will happen? And an answer will occur to them. Often the answer simply comes with us asking the question and then shutting off thinking and really listening for a response. So if you're thinking this sounds a little bit like mindfulness, absolutely. And I know I said, try not to think so much, but you know, if the forms of mindfulness that say, okay, just don't think, I tend to find those too difficult. So maybe an easier way to, than just saying don't think is really more orienting toward listening. So asking a question and just paying attention, like what's gonna come up? What's, what feeling is gonna come up? What image is gonna come up? What thought is gonna bubble up? And sometimes it does take some practice to, to decode those or begin to find words for them. I think of it like learning to read Braille like I imagine if I were suddenly trying to learn to read Braille, that, that like moving my hand across the page, I would be pretty convinced if I didn't know better that there was nothing meaningful there to find. It would just be like a texture or chaos, randomness. But if I let myself keep trying and feeling it and feeling it and tracking it and learning and making patterns, let my mind do it what it does, make patterns, suddenly the brain could decode it and make it meaningful. So in a similar way that it would take, you know, a little time and practice to learn Braille, because something in the brain literally has to be developed, it takes a little bit of practice sometimes to learn how to make sense of sort of, the, again, the images, the little impulses, the impressions that begin to come to mind, to collect them into an overarching, you know, reality or thought or truth that we could actually put into words. So there's all sorts of tricks that people have developed to make this process easier, many of which use imagination. One of my favorite of these is what's called doing parts work. In other words, picturing these little schemas as a little person. As crazy as that sounds, when we picture that as a, as a little personality or a little creature or person inside our mind, it makes it easier for the brain to both ask questions and listen for answers, simply because the brain's just much more um, accustomed to dialoguing with people. So if you picture it in that way, the brain's just on more familiar territory. And also these little schemas, they have within them uh, like a worldview, an expectation of reality, emotions, and uh, behavioral impulses, behavioral patterns. So if you think about it, in a way they are like these little simplified people or personalities. So actually the metaphor, that image helps the brain kind of collect what otherwise could seem kind of complex into one image because we're used to people being that complex. We're used to them having a, a take on reality and a behavior. So that image actually will capture for us, um, like a, make it more concrete for our mind. If we tune in to a behavioral pattern or a critical inner voice and say, okay, if that were a person, what would it look like? okay, that's me at 10 years old, kind of curled up, I'm scared. And I'm telling myself these things. 
or that's a part of me that's like really tough and trying to, you know, it's like a little um, scrappy, you know, inner part and she's angry. So we might begin to have an image like that simply because then we've like more localized that schema and can more comfortably begin to have a conversation or relationship with it. So we might ask the little girl who's in the corner like, okay, why are, what, are you, why, what are you doing there? Why are you so scared? Why are you curled up? Why are you disconnecting from everybody you love? And then if we asked it kindly, which interestingly, the rules of relationships still apply. Like if we go to a part of our mind and are critical, like, God, why are you so afraid? Get over it. We're not going to get information. <laughs> but if we go nicely and really sincerely ask, then that part will give us the response back and begin to like open for us the information that is held in that part of the brain. So there are many forms of therapy that work this way with parts, most famously internal family systems. There's even a book called Self Therapy that teaches you how to work with your own parts in that manner. But whatever technique you use, the important thing is to figure out what your mind believes. And when you're approaching that mission, the first step is to start with where you're suffering. So figure out what point of suffering or what pattern that either causes me pain or causes me to get stuck. What is it that I don't like about my own way of processing life? It's easiest if you can start with a behavioral response, like something you actually do, like criticizing yourself or gosh, I always nag at my husband or I always shut down when someone's giving me a compliment. But you can also start with just an anxious feeling or a depressed mood. But either way, begin to bring it into focus. If you do it like with parts work, you might see a person or you might just find it in your body. Like this is where that place lives. And then other images like a black hole or an animal might come. But sure enough, information will begin to come into awareness, like associations that can give some meaning as to what's the beliefs that underlie either that feeling or that behavioral pattern. So let's just say the pattern is self-criticism. So you might tune in, you might picture the inner critic if you want to do it with parts and ask it, what are you afraid would happen if you stopped criticizing me? Again, that's what we're getting toward. What are you afraid would happen if you stopped doing X, Y, and Z? Or if you don't want to do parts work, you can just tune into God, when I'm feeling self-critical, there's like this tightness in my chest. And you might just stay there and say, okay, and fill in the sentence. I must be self-critical. I must tell myself I'm bad because if I don't and just see what comes, try it a number of times. I must tell myself I'm bad because if I don't begin to let the sort of coherent, meaningful, like the, the way that this actually does make sense. And it is a weird way, adaptive or a solution to a problem, beginning to assume it's there and letting that information emerge. If it really doesn't feel like an adaptation, like it just feels like a sadness. And maybe you can even identify a part like that's me at 10 years old when my dad died or something. Well, it may be more like a memory of an emotion or an emotional truth of like aloneness because there really was a time you were alone. In that moment, the, the next step would be to just show up for that part and give support love, self-compassion, connection. In a way that is actually a disconfirmation because it's saying, oh, there's this deep sense of aloneness, but I'm here. But sometimes just giving care to a place that's simply scared or hurting can be a wonderful first step. By the way, if you have a trauma history, it is probably advisable for you to do this with the help of a therapist. And really that can be helpful for anybody. That being said, I'm really trying to want this all to seem more normal. Like in my fantasy future, we would just do this with friends, certainly with our children, maybe with a teacher. It would just be more part of everyday life to kind of slow down and get in touch with and really have a sense for what's driving our feelings and our behaviors. And if all that seems like a little out there for you, like too touchy feely or kind of new agey or something, I mean, this is not new agey at all. It's incredibly rational. I mean, it's kind of a funny thing because literally by nature, it's a non-rational process, but it's very rational to do this non-rational process, if that makes sense. 
because it's just the nature of reality that our brain is processing all sorts of information non-consciously. And it's the nature of reality that we have to use other forms than just logic to get that information that we have to and that we can, even if it's a little bit more in a felt, maybe using creativity, imagination, mindfulness, but that it is possible and logical to access and try to understand ourself. So that's my little pep talk for us all learning to understand ourselves. And you'd be surprised how much can shift just by making the implicit more explicit. And even though there's more to the transformation process, which we'll talk about next, that's disconfirmation. If you've gone as far as to be able to put into words and really have a felt sense for what your implicit schemas and your marching orders for how to be human are, you've done the hardest part already. So now let's talk about disconfirmation. I know I spent a lot of time talking about reactivation, that first phase, and I think that's just because it can be kind of a vague idea of how to make something unconscious and felt, so I wanted to give some ideas. But also, if you've done that part, that's sort of half the battle. In fact, in coherence therapy, which Bruce Ecker developed, at the end of each session, the therapist will really get clear about the schema identified in that session and will write the words out on an index card to give to the client with the homework assignment being, read this card that says the, the sort of words of your unconscious belief morning and night and really feel how true it feels. Now I know some of my students were like, well, isn't that gonna convince them more? It's like, no, it won't convince them more. Their brain already believes this. It could not be any more convinced. It just helps the brain get out of the habit of this being unconscious, really anchoring it in conscious awareness. It also opens up a chance for the disconfirmation to come. So for instance, if somebody has on their card, let's say it's a woman and she has, nobody cares about me. Then she, you know, she reads the card in the morning and then goes out you know, to the kitchen and there's her loving daughter wanting to give her a hug. Now, it's not that that you know, hug, it's the first time she's ever gotten love from her daughter or her husband but it will land in a new way if she was just consciously aware that on some unconscious level, she really believes that no one loves her. So by having it activated right there, that's like activating that neural net where the memory lives, then when the disconfirm happens, that changes the implicit memory to now be opened for change. It goes into that learning mode. So now a five, window, five hour window opens where if she even just thinks of the hug again, just any other additional disconfirmation, then the new information will come in that will forever erase the idea that nobody loves me. Now I know you may be thinking, well, what if that woman doesn't have a daughter or husband to love her? Well, the bottom line with that is we're not trying to introduce like an airy fairy version of reality we just want the brain to be really conscious of its reality and then walk around in the reality the person actually lives in. Because there's a good chance those are pretty different. And we want to update based on their actual lived context, not on some idealized context. So if they're still in an abusive relationship and they're still not safe, the brain should still believe I'm not safe because that person's gonna have to be on guard and preparing. That being said, then the schema to work on first might be something about, you know, this is what love looks like, something that keeps them in that relationship, or I don't deserve to be treated any differently. So there still, still might be a schema to work with, but we're only trying to bring people into that, like reality as it is. And there's a pretty good chance that it is different than our expectation of it. And you may think, nothing's changed since I was a child. I'm still alone. You know, I'm still around unsafe people or cold people who are not nice to me. But the one difference that is always the case is that you're no longer a child facing it. So your adult brain does have more options available than it did when, it was, when we were a child. And I think some of our lingering sense of disempowerment and sort of angsty frustration or helplessness or collapse often comes from an underlying association that tells us we're weak or that there's nothing we can do, when really that is no longer true. 
It's there though, because it certainly was true when we were young. When we're young, we're pretty disempowered. So that feeling can kind of pull forward. But at the very least, that's a disconfirmation we all have available. Recently, I was working with a client where I asked him to ask himself, this is an uh, IFS technique, I asked him to ask that schema, that part, how old does that part think you are? And he kind of looked at me and he said, oh my gosh, an answer just came. It said, you're 25, absolutely, of course you're 25, when really he's 45. And he just looked at me like, wow, this is real stuff. But even something as simple as that, like don't assume your brain has even caught up to your real age. Now I know intellectually we all know, like cognitively, of course we know what our real age is. But on a felt level, our, our, when we're kids, we're just getting the take of reality. What is it to be human? And one of the things that could get encoded is there's nothing I can do. I'm powerless. These problems are too big for me. Because in truth, they really were when we were young. On a similar note, one other disconfirmation we always at least have potential to access is self-compassion. So let me say why that's a disconfirmation. You know, when we're children and we're alone, we're really alone. So that implicit felt sense, I'm alone, I'm small, there's no one there for me. It's true. But when we're adults, there's always an adult available for us, ourself, that can give the comfort. And honestly, even self-given comfort, like, oh, I'm here, I care about my feelings, I care about this part of my experience, can be incredibly powerful in terms of being comforting and resourcing. So if you're not good at self-compassion, there's a good chance that's because you simply haven't got the schema online enough yet. How I see it in my office is that usually if that early learning is really made conscious, like if they really get it, like, wow, I really believed I didn't deserve love. And they can like look into that little kid's eyes sort of that feels, feels that way and get it. Usually, because we all tend to have empathy for suffering, if it's really clear, usually care begins to flow naturally without as much effort. Now, as wonderful as self-love is, if you're wanting to change your original schemas and some of them are about you know, relationships, it probably wouldn't hurt to also put yourself around some love or seek out communities that are safe and supportive or even just noticing the love that's already there or the positive empowering experiences or, or hopeful experiences in your current life. And when you notice them, linger, put your awareness on them. You see, it takes the amygdala 20 seconds to register a positive experience, whereas it takes only a quarter of a second to register a negative experience. <laughs> so when we have hopeful, good things happening to us, ones that may disconfirm our schema, we want to actually just get in the practice of paying attention to those. So when good things happen, give yourself at least 20 seconds to take it in so that now that gets internalized as a possible disconfirmation to use either in the moment or later. So while you're getting in the habit of noticing and lingering with the positive, of course it wouldn't help to put yourself in new contexts where positive things are more likely to happen. I think group therapy is a great option. Gosh, I've seen people witness all sorts of new things and have all sorts of new learnings in group or other communities like a church or even just you know, relating directly to God if that's a reality for you. We could talk for a long time about how to use spirituality for the transformational process, you know, feeling what you really believe and then turning for God to see what returns by way of a deeper truth. That could be an amazing disconfirmation. Or of course, you can see a therapist to help facilitate this disconfirmation for you through their presence or through imaginal work. But whatever you do to get both the reactivation, whether it's journaling or mindfulness or parts work, making the implicit explicit, and whatever you do for the disconfirmation, whether it's self-compassion work or being around new, new people and new contexts, or even simply filtering through your life experience to see if you already have the disconfirmation. Like, okay, I'm really getting a sense that my anger will, will make people reject me. But you know, my cousin, one time I got mad at her and she actually talked to me about it and we got closer through it. So it doesn't even have to be a new thing. It could be a disconfirmation that's already somewhere living in your brain, something the brain knows. 
It just hasn't connected and integrated to shift the first original take. So when you have both, however you get there, the next thing is to let them both be in awareness at the same time. Like tune in to the original schema and feel how true it feels. My anger is gonna push people away. And then tune into the new learning or the disconfirmation, which again, can't just be a, an idea. It has to feel true to the brain as well. And just go back and forth a few times. If you simply do that, it gives the brain the chance to actually update its view of reality. It doesn't take long, but once that update happens, it's permanent. So I wish you the best in your journey toward transformation, whether it's through journaling or parts work or prayer or therapy. And in our next video, we'll talk about how to get the most out of therapy. And there's a lot to say about that. But I encourage you to find some way to really know what your brain believes. Like in its heart of hearts, what does your brain believe from the past? And then let it come in contact experientially with the reality of your present. Thank you.